But anyway, thank you all for coming today. This year, approximately 4 million cats and dogs will be killed in so-called shelters across North America. The vast majority of these animals can and should be placed in loving homes or should never end up in a shelter in the first place. Many in the animal industries cling to their failed models of the past, models that result in the killing of millions of cats and dogs every year. Increasingly, the practice of both humane societies and municipal animal control agencies are out of step with the public sentiment. Does that work? Yep. <laughs> Today, most Canadians hold the humane treatment of animals as a personal value, which is reflected in our cultural practices, the proliferation of organizations for animal protect, founded for animal protections, and I include the multitude of rescue groups, the multitude of community volunteers. Increased per capita spending on our pets, I mean the pet food industry, pet toy industry, pet grooming industry, pet colored soft paws industry, billions and billions of dollars. People in our culture care about our cats and dogs. And also reflected by the great advancement in veterinary medicine. But the agencies that the public expects to protect animals instead are killing millions. This is a breach of their public trust, a gross deviation from their responsibility to protect animals, and a point of view that we as caring people in a humane com community cannot tolerate and will not accept any longer. But there is hope. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the no-kill movement and strategies to help communities move towards no more homeless pets. Before I start, I'd like to talk to you a little about the language that I'm going to be using, the reasons why, and give you some definitions. Shelters, animal industries, in quotes, <laughs> and municipal organizations continue to use language that misleads the public and glosses over the nature of their actions, such as euthanasia, unadoptable, fractious, putting to sleep, and other euphemisms that downplay the gravity of ending life and make the task of killing easier. And make it easier for us to hear it, it's more pal palatable, we can just dismiss it and say, oh bad, so sad, and continue with our lives. I'd like to give you a few definitions. Many people in the room probably already know this. Euthanasia is the humane ending of a life to cause intractable pain or for a terminal illness. Fractious is a word to describe irritable and kind of grumpy. I actually kind of thought I knew what I what looked, but I had to look it up and I thought, whoa, that could be useful <laughs> for a lot of uh, situations. But that's a word that people in the animal industries will use to describe a cat that's unadoptable because the cat is fractious. Really what the cat is, is afraid. So if you have a cat that has been living on the street, lost its home, has been kind of forced to survive on the street, it ends up in a cage in a totally unfamiliar, cold, horrible shelter that must have terribly bad vibes all through it. And when you go near it, it hisses at you, or if you go to grab it, it puts its paw up, those are simply self-defensive uh, behaviors of an animal that is afraid and, and then that cat is labeled fractious and unadoptable. People sometimes wonder what the no-kill movement is and what that means. No-kill is a goal where a community will achieve a 90% live save rate, which means that of the animals that are, the cats and dogs that are coming into your shelter, that you will be able to save 90% of them. And when people decide on moving towards no-kill, they will put a time limit on it. We're hoping to be no-kill in five years, or in two years. But that's, that's the goal, is 90% life save rate. How it started, it was about 50 years ago, there was a little bit of a change in terms of public consciousness. There was a 
great issue with a lot of stray dogs and stray cats in North America. And it was actually kind of horrific how uh, municipalities dealt with them. It was common to just round them up and, and drown them in the river, that kind of thing. And at, at the same time, a group of individuals started to think, this isn't proper, this is not humane. So a lot of the movement started with just individual rescuers doing rescues in their home. And at the same time, I think it was in New York, and I can't remember his name, I want to say Henry Bird, but I could be incorrect, was the first person who started the SPCA. And it was directly in response to the city drowning stray dogs in the river. And then in the early 90s, the movement really took off. And in 1994, the radical example of Richard Avazino in the San Francisco, he was the president of the San Francisco SBCA, and he was the first, they were the first urban community to adopt no-kill. And they achieved that within a very short period of time. Since then, the movement is just tumbling forward, tumbling forward. Um, we, there are many, many municipalities in the states that are adopting uh, no-kill, which leads to no more homeless pets. So you don't have any more cats and dogs that don't have a home. All of the adoptable ones, which are probably more than 90%, end up in, in their forever homes. So the first step to becoming a no-kill community is a decision. It's a commitment to reject kill-oriented ways of doing business. No kill starts as an act of will, and the next step involves putting in place the infrastructure to save lives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about all the programs that make up um, No Kill and the No More Homeless Pets movement. And it's kind of like an umbrella that every, every one of the programs is like one of the spokes of the umbrella. So obviously you can't just take one program, put it on one side, the umbrella falls over, it doesn't work. And that can't be used as an excuse to say, oh, no kill doesn't move, it doesn't work. So you need to have all of these programs. So I'm not, there aren't in any particular order in terms of priority. I think they all probably have the same priority. The first one I'd like to talk about is one that is very, very special to my heart, and that is feral cats, or as they are more commonly called now, community cats, to sort of engage people in realizing that they're part of our community, that it is a community issue that the community is responsible for. Cats are not indigenous wildlife, they're not scums or raccoons, the only reason a cat is ever on the street is because of us. So there's kind of a shift to start talking about them as community cats because changing language can change the way people think about issues. So TNR stands for Trap, Neuter and Return. And I would imagine most people in this room know what it is, so I'll just give a very, very brief synopsis of it. What will happen is when a cat ends up on the street, a lost cat, it will revert to its, its natural ways to try and survive, the same as you and I would. You know, it's all about survival out there. So those cats, and a feral cat is kind of a fluid line. You can't say, this is a feral cat, this isn't cats so move in and out of that, con that uh, continuum. We've trapped cats that were like completely wild. Within a week in their home, they're just like unbelievable, just totally socialized, big sucky cats. Um, Vicky was talking about the first colony, and there was a big, big male in that colony that he looked so rough. We tried for about two years to get him. I'm sure he must have like, I don't know how many thousands of us offspring. We had to, uh, one of our volunteers was helping, we had to buy a huge giant trap to get him. When we finally got him and I had him in my cat shelter in my backyard, which I don't have a cat shelter in my backyard, um, <laughs> I actually had to go in with the broom because he was going to come to get me. I eventually started with the long back scratcher kind of trying to touch him. Within about three weeks, he totally capitulated. He was adopted by one of my sister, who has a pet sitting business with clients. He's named after a Persian poet called Rumi, and is probably spoiled more than any of us ever will be. And so he deserves that. So to label a cat feral is a very difficult thing to do. The cats that are truly feral are cats that have been born outside. So they have no human contact, and they're typically very afraid of people. Vicky's giving me the signs, so I'm going to have to talk quicker. 
Um, so historically what we've done is simply uh, trap these cats and kill them. And it hasn't worked. If it had worked, we wouldn't have the issue that we have now. And I am trained myself not to say problem because I don't like to think of the fact that there are other creatures on the earth as a problem, so I call it an issue. So if our historical methods of uh, dealing with, with uh, community cats or feral cats had worked, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now. What does work is trapping them, taking them to the vet, getting them shot, so it totally takes care of the public health issues in terms of rabies, getting them neutered or spayed so they do not have more babies, and they are in managed colonies. And it is a highly successful program with proven successes in many municipalities. Uh, so that, that, that's one part of the no-kill. You have to have TNR. A feral cat should never go to a shelter. It's four days of terror and death. A feral cat should never go to a shelter. In Jacksonville, Florida, they have a program that if a feral cat ends up at the stretch at, at uh, the shelter, the animal control people will call a rescue right away who will come and get it, get it fixed, and return it to its colony. The next, the next uh, sort of spoke of the umbrella is high volume, low cost spay neuter. An absolute necessity, an absolute necessity. The many people in our community do not have the resources to be responsible pet owners. And this is kind of an interesting little shift. We're always hearing about animal agencies blaming the irresponsible pet owners. I'd like us to think about the irresponsible stewardship from the, uh, from the animal industries who are making a lot of money and the municipalities. If you have a person who brings in, there's a little stray cat or two stray cats on their street, and they don't have the heart to just shut the door, turn the hose on it, or take it to the pound where it absolutely will get killed, and they bring it in. They may not have $600 dispo dollars disposable income to get two cats um, fixed and they're shot. So what happens? By next spring, they have six kittens. So now there are eight cats. Now if that person calls up one of the animal industries in town, there's a really good chance those cats will be seized and there'll be an article in the paper about them being a hoarder, right? So they lay low. They don't know what to do. Um, or if they call a municipality, they'll get charged because there's a pet limit by law. So what can happen is a year from now there could be 12 cats and then they're really in trouble. What, when I went to the uh, No More Homeless Pets conference in October, what Vets Friends does is they have a health helper. So instead of ostracizing these people and labeling, labeling them and taking their animals away and charging them for violating bylaws or whatever, they actually say, you know, look, you're in over your head, we're going to help you. We're going to get the cats spayed and we're going to help you get them adopted. They can come to our adoption events. So it's a bit of a different way of thinking about instead of always blaming the irresponsible pet owners, let's make it easy for people to be responsible pet owners. So let's take down the barriers and one of the might be the cost of spay and neuter, but absolutely high volume spay and neuter is an absolute necessity to achieve a no-kill community. The next is working with the rescue groups. The rescue groups are the salt of the earth. The rescue groups are the ones who have changed things in the city by becoming political, as Liz said, and we were all like, we don't want to. We don't want to, but we had to. So the rescue groups working together. Those in any community that I know of, the rescue groups are the ones that have been doing it. And they are the ones who have been the activists, you know that really bad word because you actually take an action instead of not doing anything. They're the ones who have pushed this no-kill agenda forward. The next is foster care. You need to have places, especially for um, bottle babies. If you have a pound um, that, you know, 7.30 at night, the door is shut. They have two kittens that are three and a half weeks old, and the call is they have to be out of the cage by 7.30. That means we're killing them at 7.30 if you don't have somewhere for them. So obviously, little babies, uh, puppies and kittens can't be adopted until they're older, so you need a extensive foster care in the community that will support these animals until they are adoptable, and also, to take that further, that will support animals that are maybe really shy, Right? Maybe you're really shy and they need a little while to rehab or they're, they're nervous and, and they have separation anxiety. So that's what foster, that's the, the spoke of the foster care program. Ah, I don't know what 
that means. Oh, comprehensive adoption programs. So this is one of the things where we really need to start to change our way of thinking about adoption. We can't just sit back and wait for the people to come to us. We have to realize that what we've been doing so far just doesn't work, so let's change it. So lots of innovative ideas about adoptions. We have Super Adoption Day now in London, which is just a fabulous, fabulous event. Uh, many groups in the States, I think these are from Best Friends, um, do a lot of really interesting media things, a lot of interesting social media things. So the friend you love has also been waiting for you. Meet each other at your local animal shelter. Um, this is one from for feral cats. Homeless, not helpless. Although Ellie Cat Alleys would challenge me on this and say, these cats aren't homeless, they have a home outside. Get a good managed colony. And here's another one, companionship, pure and simple. The friend you're looking for is at your local animal shelter. So to really educate people about adopt, don't shop. The reason why that, well personally I think nobody be, should be breeding, but the reason why that people should not be breeding cats and dogs. Uh, so really to shake it up in terms of the adoption, adoption issues. And to make adoption something really, really positive. When you guys have a moment, you should look at the video on uh, YouTube from the Nevada Humane Society. They have what's called the adoption dance. So when someone comes and uh, they're going to adopt this dog, and so they come and all the staff are there and there's the music and everybody's doing a hip hop dancing or whatever, and the, and the woman comes and then from the back comes this kind of fat yellow dog. I think it's maybe might have been named Ginger. And there's balloons and it comes up and it, just when it gets to the lady who's going to adopt it, just wags its tail. And they're, hooray, Ginger has been adopted. And I learned a lot when I, you know, when I start um, screening people for adoptions, I turn it into a really positive thing. I say, you know, I'm so happy you're doing this. This is, you are so kind to be giving me, this is going to be so great for you. Do you love this cat? Do you love this cat already? Do you love him already? So that kind of, uh, of making it a very positive thing, a very wonderful, socially acceptable thing to do, buying a dog for a breeder, um, to change the way that we use to evaluate dogs or cats that are ready for adoption. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that there is a program where you evaluate a cat for, who is in a shelter for four days to find out whether she is adoptable or not when she's terrified, right? And if you look, very disheartening, if you look at the reasons why cats are killed, um, you know, I've seen it myself, it would be old, fat, and grumpy. And those are even just one, all three. I would really not want to end up in a shelter, that's for sure. <laughs> the other thing is public relations and communications. So instead of having your pound somewhere off where nobody quite knows and nobody can really talk about it or whatever, you engage the whole community, right? You have good public relations so that People want to go to the pound. I don't know how many people I've heard say, I don't want to go to what is called a humane society for a pound, because it'll just be too depressing. It'll just be too sad. I can't go there. I can't look at them. I can't do it. So totally reframe it and make it into something positive. Volunteers. Volunteers are free labor. And if, if with the no-kill movement, if you engage with the community, you can make use of the volunteers that are already doing all that work out there already, and they actually have all the knowledge to make it successful. Proactive redemptions, by that I mean uh, many of the cats, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about cats because there, there are so many more of them, that are killed in shelters or because they are not reclaimed. So when you live in a city, like we do, where cat license, which is the best way to get your cat home, is a little tag on a collar that comes off and then now your cat is not identified. It ends up at a pound where you have to actually physically go out there all the way out to Pine Valley. In fact, you can't even give a lost report over the phone in the summer if your cat wasn't licensed. So that's a way to punish your animal because you didn't buy a cat license. We're not even going to talk here about your lost cat. You take a picture out there, it goes in a three ring, ring binder, it stays there for, I don't know, a couple of days. So. Proactive redemption, so animals are really returned in Calgary, which is a stellar model in our own country. 
They have a system where if, a, if they find a cat from a neighborhood within hours of getting that cat, they've taken a digital picture of it, they have postcards, and they do a mass distribution within like five blocks of where that cat was found. So uh, proactive redemptions. And then, how much more time do I have? Just a little bit? Okay. I'm awesome. The last thing is uh, I need some some uh, audience participation, because I'm going to talk about one really important part of the no-kill equation, and that's a compassionate director. So, someone who doesn't know me or something. I need a volunteer. Okay, okay. come on up. Okay, so this isn't really the nicest thing, I guess, but I need you to help me with something. Sorry, your name is Gertie. Hi. Um, so we're at the pound, and we have this cat who's been here for four days, but he, he's neutered too, is kind of, kind of nervous. He did have a collar on once, because we can see the line around his throat. But it's gone. We don't know who he is. Nobody's called about him. You know, we've got too many. The rescue groups in town are all like crazy, radical people. We want to deal with them. You know, we've, we've got, we've, you know, it's the end of the business day. You know, we've, we've got to do something. So, uh, no, he didn't have a microchip because we don't, we don't promote that in our city. We're promoting cat licenses that go on collars. Well, that's good. So, anyway, I need you to help me. You're going to turn this cat over, we're going to hold him, and then I want you to take this syringe, and you're going to give him an IP injection in his belly and kill him. Yeah. Wow, we have an, an interesting dilemma, because in 2010 in our city, someone did that 1,420 times. So after he's killed, now we're going to put him in the garbage bag, <laughs> gonna go in the garbage bag. Put him in. Come on, we got we have we we got a lot to do today. Got 31 more cats to do, and now he's gonna go to the city dump. Now, this is a perfect example of why you need a compassionate director. If you have someone who can do that 1,420 times in a year and not really get too upset about it, you have a problem. You need a compassionate director who says, this isn't right, I can't do this. I have a little price for you and then I will just continue and finish up. It's just a little price, but it's a button that says compassion. Because this is a compassionate person. <laughs> life is an extremely serious one and should always be treated as such. No matter how many animals the shelter kills, each and every animal is an individual and each deserves individual consideration. If you do not have a compassionate director at the helm, all the programs will be thwarted and sabotaged. There was one, I just uh, want to steal this, this last little, uh, it says it much more succinctly than I can. The final element of the no-kill equation is the most important of all, without which all other elements are thwarted. A hard-working, compassionate animal control or shelter director, not content to regurgitate tired cliches or hide behind the myth of too many animals, not enough poems. So that is extremely important. So, to finish up, I'd like to say that in short, shelters must take killing off the table for savable animals and utilize the programs and services of the no-kill equations, not sometimes, not merely when it is convenient or politically expedient like before an election when the pound gets a new coat of paint, but for every single animal every day. We must stop the killing and fix our broken animal shelter system.